Right off the bat, we cut through the unnecessary prologue and jump right into a daring Decepticon raid on Autobot HQ during what appears to be Arts and Crafts Night. This ain't Larry Parr we're dealing with here, people. It's David Wise. We like him. He created Alpha Trion, and didn't think it was beneath him to appear in a bonus feature on one of the DVDs, and he knows how to write a fucking Transformers episode. The attack, naturally, is a diversion. Decepticon Science, by which I can only assume we mean Soundwave, because really, who else could it be, creates a spray that renders Megatron invisible. So he and his most trusted lieutenant, Starscream, sneak into the Ark to catch a glimpse of some Autobots in their bras and panties. Or reprogram the recharging units to make them evil. One of those. You would think that this cool invisibility spray would be enough evil for this week's scheme, but as always, Megatron has to develop some elaborate plan that combines two entirely unrelated things. Dude, pace yourself. We have something like 80 episodes to go. Do the invisible thing this week and maybe the turn the Autobots bad thing next week. Really, it's just the hypno-chip bring Cybertron into Earth's orbit debacle all over again. I think my favorite part about the whole plan is the fact that you can just flip some kind of switch in a robot to make him evil. You know, like the entire issue of Transformer morality boils down to the difference between mix and whip on a blender. Ooh, I see the problem. You had this set on evil. Optimus apparently has spider sense in this episode. My warning diode is pulsating. But it's not enough to give him a specific idea of what's going down. So the Autobots walk right into their recharging chamber things, which we've never seen before and won't see again, and are instantly turned into bad guys. How can we tell? Well, their eyes are red now. And they're jerks. We also learn that Teletran 1 can feel pain, which is a lot funnier than it should be. Optimus Prime! No! They decide, with some off-screen prodding by Megatron, to head to the launch of a new solar power satellite thing and wreck up the place. Yes, yeah, solar power again. As far as I can tell, solar power is Season 2's Earth's molten core. Meanwhile, Jazz, Bumblebee, and the useless humans are out in the middle of nowhere testing Jazz's new speakers. Bumblebee forgot his earmuffs, his words, so decides to go back to base, where he finds Teletran wounded and the rare variant Evil Blue Streak waiting for him. He tries to talk the little guy into recharging, which for me comes off as a little... awkward. I mean, follow my logic here. Blue Streak is a full-sized Autobot. Bumblebee is little like a child. Blue Streak's trying to force him into either bed or the bathtub, depending on which creepy human metaphor you prefer. This is as close to bad touch as an Autobot can get. Thankfully, Jazz charges in like some kind of jive-talking social worker and saves the day. Sparkplug repairs Teletran and works out a way to turn the bad good guys into good good guys again, which is pretty impressive feat considering his name isn't Chip. Spike and Bumblebee head off on a poorly thought-out rescue mission while this is happening, and we know those always end well. At the Air Force Base, Evil Hound and Evil Ratchet go after Dr. Harding, the inventor of the solar satellite. Dr. Harding is the kind of self-assured, capable female that was quite prominent in both this show and G.I. Joe. Characters like her, and to a greater degree the Baroness, are almost certainly why I'm so into chicks with glasses now. But I digress. Harding bravely flees her would-be captors and even manages to look hot while crawling into a dumpster. So Sparkplug invents an attitude exchanger, which I'm pretty sure is a real thing and not literally a device for exchanging the emotional attitude of a sentient being. But I guess he had to call it something. They test one out on Evil Blue Streak and are pleased to find out that it works. You can tell because his eyes turn back to blue. They eventually make their way to Optimus and the rest, who have been mindlessly smashing stuff at the Air Force Base all this time, and enjoying it perhaps a little too much. Shockingly, Bumblebee's plan of whine at Optimus until he turns good again doesn't pan out, but he does manage to redeem himself by attaching the attitude exchanger just in the nick of time. Skyfire, whose brief turn as a bad guy is actually treated with an appropriate level of terror, carts the gang into near orbit to stop Megatron and safely see the satellite on its way. They succeed, of course, but only because the power of Jazz's rock saves the day. I love this episode. Oh, and Sparkplug's reward for his services? Hold on, hold on. There's a little matter of the 47 Air Force jets you guys demolished when you were working for Megatron. <laughs> so I hope you're both wizards when it comes to fixing broken aircraft. <laughs> yeah, Dad. That's all any of us will be doing for the next few weeks. Lift that wrench, tote that retrocharger. <laughs> <laughs> My life is a joke. And now it's time for this week's science lesson. In two Earth hours, we will be aboard that rocket and on our way to Cybertron. And the secret of perpetual energy will be ours alone. Apparently, the power of a single medium-sized star filtered through a device built by late 20th century Americans is infinite. We really don't give ourselves enough credit. 
You distract him, and I'll give it a try. First, drain evil. Second, recharge good. Let's hope it don't finish up with Thurberry Jam. Yeah. 